That was really awesome and lively to hear everybody. And I just want to welcome everybody here to this work session where we're going to be discussing the um, superintendent right. performance right. evaluation template. And so Gary and people. Andrew, we didn't have talked about this, but this is your firm. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Ready to jump in, I think. I don't have a link in, in my invitation. So I'm going to try and share some stuff. Um, Julia, can you hear us fine? Can you speak so we can make sure we can hear you? How about that? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Back to mute. And then I know we've got some handouts. I want to make sure everyone has them. Um, Julia, apologies if you don't have it. Uh, this is also, well, actually, I don't know. I, we need to make sure that Julia has it electronically. We should have um, a copy of the performance evaluation, uh, the proposed draft template. And then was that what was posted um, and then also circulated last week? Yes. Yeah, I got it. Great. And then also coming around, we have a copy of the uh, adopted board goals. And then there are a couple other documents here. It looks like an assessment calendar. These are all supposed to also have been handed out. Yes. Okay. There is the state summative assessment calendar, and there's the district assessment calendar. And then staff has also prepared um, for eighth grade a, a chart of some data. On and we'll email that chart to you directly when that works. That's what I'm looking at right now. Is this the document? Okay. And then Roseanne's gonna get me a link and then I can share. That was off for Recording in progress. Um, you have to show me before you graduate to do that. Can I can I ask that the board goals um, be posted with the meeting materials? I can pull them down that way, but that way also others have the ability to to see the bo board goals that we're referencing. Sure, the board goals are on the website, but you want to also put the meeting materials. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm gonna open, and I, I, I just came from a whole series of meetings as I know everyone else did as well, so apologies if this is a little bit disjointed, um, but we'll try and, and sort of dive in and frame a little bit of the conversation. So this work session, which we have 45 minutes for, because we need to start our, our other meeting on time, um, is to talk about the evaluation template for um, the 21-22 school year. So the school year that we are currently in that started about a month or a month and a half ago. Um, so I, I put together, and I could probably um, make this larger, but can people see that okay? Yes. Yeah. That's very hot. So I wanted to put together just a little bit of context to remind everyone um, of, of where we've been and where we are. So um, for the 2019-20 school year, so, so two years ago, um, the board formally adopted board goals. And those are, um, again, they've been posted on the website, and um, those are the, the, the document that came around. Um, and I think it's just worth, you know, um, reminding ourselves what those are. Uh, I mean, I, I, hope, I hope we think about them all the time, but they're very achievement-focused goals, um, very specifically focused on, on third grade reading, and, and not just on third grade reading, but actually moving um, um, our underserved students of color from, at the time, 44% to, to a 60% baseline for third grade reading. 
Um, there was the measure, uh, the board goal around fifth grade math, which again was, was very specifically focused on moving um, students of color from 41% meeting growth targets to 60% meeting growth targets um, by the spring of 2022. There was an eighth grade graduate portrait, which I think we'll probably talk a little bit about, although again, I want to remind you today is not the time to talk about board goals specifically, but I want to remind us what these board goals are. Um, but, but this goal was, was by spring of 2022. Um, eighth grade students will move from 44% meeting proficiency in, in, in English language arts and mathematics to 51% um, uh, as measured by the SBAC. And then um, the post-secondary readiness or readiness for college and career goal, which was by spring of 2022. Um, Portland Public School graduates who are underscored students of color moving from 50.3% to 56%, successfully completing one or more of the post-secondary indicators listed here. So these were the adopted board goals two years ago. We agreed at that point um, to evaluate the superintendent primarily based on these goals. However, as part of that conversation, we also added in some Oregon School Board Association leadership standards into that year's attempt. Um, and, and so um, OSBA puts out a tool that has um, a number of different leadership standards. I think there are eight in total. And as the board, we, we, we picked a handful of those in the 1920 school year and said, in addition to these achievement goals, we are also going to um, use the OSBA leadership standards as part of the, the superintendent's evaluation. And we did that for the year and, and we evaluated the superintendent at the end of that year um, based on, on, on those, those, those goals um, that we had laid out in that evaluation template. The next year, which is the last school year, 21, 20, school year 2021, um, as a result of COVID, the testing data that would have shown whether we were meeting our student achievement goals was not available. Superintendent his team can talk a little bit more. We did a little bit of limited testing, but not very much. Mm -hmm. so, um, that data was not available. And so as a result, the board said, okay, because we're not going to have that data available, we're just going to use OSBA leadership standards as part of the evaluation. So again, at some point around this time of year, we said, here are the standards that we want to see. We tweaked a few of them to add um, some racial equity components to them. Um, and then we used that as the evaluation. And then this last, just this past spring, that's what the board used to evaluate um, the superintendent was those OSB leadership standards. The question that's before us tonight in this work session is, what are we going to do now moving forward now that we're into the 21-22 school year? And as I said in the introductory email, we're already a little bit late. I mean, ideally, we would have um, be adopting these evaluation templates at the end of August or early September so that um, the superintendent and his team know what we're evaluating on the entire year. Um, but um, um, these are really sort of the, the, the conversations we need to have. Um, uh, board leadership asked the superintendent to put together a draft um, template. Um, and just, I have gotten a couple questions from board members about that process. Just so you know, I see that process very much like all performance management that I do. Um, every performance, every employee that I manage, I go to them at the beginning of the process and I say, lay out for me your work plan, lay out for me your, your thoughts on what you want to achieve. Um, as, as a supervisor, I then look at those, I add to them, we negotiate, we talk about timelines, and then we end up with a collaboratively designed um, uh, uh, performance plan for the year. Um, and that's really where we are right now. We've asked the superintendent to put together a template. He did. That's what we have before us to discuss tonight. Um, and that template includes both um, the board goals that we had adopted two years ago, as well as four of the OSBA standards. And that sort of segue into the next slide um, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish in this work session. And I laid out, and we're going to come back to these questions at the end. But the key questions that we're looking to um, decide tonight um, is essentially looking at, at, at the superintendent's draft evaluation template. Are there changes we want to make? Are there things we want to include? Are there things we want to take out? And specifically, I think some of the key questions, do we as a board want to include, continue including those OSB leadership standards in addition to the board goals. I'm sort of starting with the assumption that we want to use the board goals, but obviously if there are board members that want to talk about that, we can talk about that as well. But assuming that we're going to use the board goals, do we also want to use OSB leadership standards? If we do, do we want to use the four that are included here? Sort of second key question, um, is the board comfortable adopting this template, recognizing that some of the additional data um, that uh, will become available in the next few months is going to be on target setting? The superintendent can talk in more detail about this, but as you go through this, you'll see there's a lot of data, and there's a lot of new data in here we haven't seen, but there's also data that we don't have yet. And so while we know what our board goals are, we don't necessarily know where our baseline is. So we know that a goal is going to be third grade reading, fifth grade math, 
of whether we can still achieve those 60% marks or whatever you know, those numbers were, um, there's more data that, that needs to come out of that. So question is, is the board comfortable adopting the template right now, knowing we're not gonna have all the data we need for another few months? And then a third question is, we wanna move the evaluation timeline to the fall in order, to complete school, in order for complete school year data to be available. So this is something that I think has been a perennial frustration that we do the evaluation in May or June, um, all the data from the year is obviously not available because the school year is not over yet. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're sort, of, sort of looking at trends and where we're headed. One option is just to go ahead and move the evaluation to the fall. So then by that point, we will have complete school year data, and we truly are evaluating on that, on that, on that complete um, set of data. Yes, 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 and yes. <sighs> all right, we'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> now we're in charge. I'm actually, <laughs> four questions, so I'm actually I'm with you on that. <laughs> So I think with that um, sort of overall set of, maybe I'll ask the board before I turn it over to the superintendent, are there questions overall about that framing of the issue, either the context or the questions for tonight? No, no, I don't have any. And, and, and I will say as part of the timing, and, and this is just purely, and I'll, I'll apologize to Gary, I. I Ran out of time. I would have loved to run this by you, but I think I finished at about three thirty this afternoon. So, um, so maybe I'll just ask Gary if you have anything else to say. And, and again, just as a reminder of the board, Michelle has asked Gary and I to work with the superintendent both on this initial draft template and then also as this data becomes available through the year um, to work on, on 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 as we refine the targets. What do those look like? And then come back to the board because, of course, the whole board will need to adopt whatever targets are there. Um, so, with that, Gary. Um, no, that looks fine. That's a, good, that's a good start. May I add a little bit of additional context? And that's that I attended a, a mini conference slash self care retreat um, that school board partners convened this summer. And one of the sessions I attended was uh, it was one of those, it was such a small conference, every attendee attended every session. And it was on uh, superintendent evaluation. So they introduced to me some best practices that had to do with, um, as a chair, delegating the responsibility to two board members that would balance each other out in their assessment, that um, it would call for those two uh, board members to work collaboratively with the superintendent um, to, to co-create this document. Um, understanding, I think, Andrew, you you introduced that topic of, you know, it's, it's a co-collaborated document um, that we can both hold both sides accountable for. And that was also mentioned. And then there was this idea introduced of moving the deadline so to a time when we say we want to be data driven. This allows us to be data driven if we actually use the data in the evaluation. So um, again, School Board Partners is an, uh, is an organization whose mission is to create anti-racist school boards. Um, some of the practices that they um, that they shared are best practices in doing that, and 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 really allows the superintendent and the board to have a closer relationship meeting throughout the year. Um, you know, checking progress against goals generally, and 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 creating this document. Thanks. I just want to say I really appreciate the work. Andrew and Gary that you guys have done so far and you know we've been on this journey of modifying the OSBA template you know knowing that it it wasn't exactly what we wanted from the beginning but taking what we felt was useful from it and kind of tweaking it year by year and I really support um, sticking with this kind of hybrid approach and I think you guys picked out the most salient four goals that aren't um, that don't get to the same things as our own student achievement goals that get to other aspects of the superintendent's responsibilities um, in terms of management. So I appreciate that. And I also appreciate that, you know, we have recognized for the last two years that we need to make a shift in our timing um, so that we really have the data that we need when we need it. And there's no reason not to just take that leap and then we'll be in good standing going forward. I have a question um, just at the front end. Uh, where are we with the um, having some other metrics besides um, just the SBAC scores for the middle grades? Uh, when we originally set the board goals, 
um, the two SBAC scores were going to be um, placer, placeholders for a more complex um, and comprehensive uh, goal. And I'm just, I'm curious uh, what's the status of that and when we would expect to see, to be having a conversation about what that might look like. So maybe that's a good segue, um, Superintendent, to sort of walk through um, briefly um, sort of the, the, the template that's here, and Julia will, will hit your question um, as well about, about that. Sure. Um, good evening, directors. I appreciate the, the introductory framing uh, here. Um, it's true, uh, in most cases in the state of Oregon, uh, elected school boards will default to the OSBA superintendent evaluation tool. Um, uh, in, in our case, um, we did that, I, I think, first year uh, of, of the administration here. And so that was looking at eight leadership standards, the eight OSBA uh, superintendent leadership standards. Um, and so you saw my self-reflection, the board spoke to them. It was pretty cumbersome mm -hmm. to look at those eight standards holistically. Uh, we had a lot of conversation and a lot of work that the board put in around, you know, how do we move in the direction of also placing a, a square focus on student achievement? And, and if that's our focus area as a board, then how do we also hold accountable the superintendent to those same board goals? So there was a lot of work done uh, to create uh, a bit of a hybrid of a tool uh, with a, a prioritized set of standards, not all eight, and uh, continue to measure our progress for the superintendent's accountability tool uh, on the board goals. So we had, uh, and, and so in, in putting together a, a, a draft template or tool uh, for discussion here, you see again sort of that balance for four selected leadership standards, the board's prerogative, which four? Uh, there's four suggested here, uh, as well as the board goals. So um, the challenge um, with you know continuing on uh, using achievement data is that for the last two years we really don't have any. Uh, we don't have any summative data because the state of Oregon canceled those uh, in, in 2020, and then in 2021 we had this discussion at the school board with staff around, does it make sense with students returning for a week later to start assessing the window of summative assessments? And we agreed for board resolution that this year we would do a full assessment calendar uh, at, at all the administered grade levels. So you see actually in the handouts, uh, the state's assessment calendar for all the state assessments and tests uh, that are required by grade level and content area. And you also see the PPS district uh, assessment calendar. Uh, so they range from foundational literacy assessments like the Dibbles in the early grades to uh, map reading and math, uh, etc. And so um, in regards to an evaluation cycle, if you're gauging uh, progress uh, uh, over time, you need enough uh, inputs and, and data cycles to uh, have gone. So we're, we're all anxious about this first uh, first quarter assessments uh, with the map uh, to see where our students are at. It'll be the first time that we have that kind of uh, uh, indicator. Uh, we did do one last year, mid-year. So we have a growth measure for last year, mid-year, and the year before, mid-year. So those are kind of the only comparators we have at the moment. But this fall, and then again in the winter, that begins to sort of give us a, a clearer picture of where students are across the grade level. Um, so that we can look back to the performance targets that we had established two years ago in the board goals and ask ourselves, uh, we know that students everywhere across the country, regardless of district, if there's some unfinished learning, there's some disproportionate impact on how students uh, uh, are achieving or how they've been affected by this pandemic and uh, the interruptions to the continuity of learning. And so uh, if we're able to reflect back on the last mid-year this fall's assessment and the winter assessment, we can begin to set some points on a chart to start to project uh, what a reasonable rates of growth are. And as you know, for us, this is about accelerated learning right now. And so uh, what, what's an ambitious performance target? If, if we, we, could, we could just be audacious and say it should be up here, uh, but, but how are we realistic in uh, understanding how we want to be data informed about the, the work that, that we're doing. So 
And the same way a teacher is going to use that math assessment uh, to inform the work they do uh, in their lesson planning and their instruction, in the same way a principal is going to use that school-wide data uh, to lead conversations with grade-level teams and their instructional leadership teams, in the same way that principal supervisors are going to use that data when meeting with their cohorts of principals and in their instructional rounds around what are some of the strategies, uh, how are we as system leaders uh, investing our resources uh, to try to address uh, some of the growth areas that, that, that need attention. So that is, those are the cycles of continuous improvement or PDSA cycles, uh, plan, do, study, act, uh, that, that is the work of school and district improvement. So in, in the first, uh, if I skip to the second half of the tool, well, let me, just to start off with the first one, you see four leadership standards in the tool. This is just cut and paste from OSBA's evaluation tool. Uh, so you see substandards for each of the leadership standards. Ours deviates a little bit from OSBA's because this board had a conversation about a couple of additions and edits that you wanted to see in here, so those are still included here. There's also a description around what evidence of success looks like in the right column. So you see standards one uh, around visionary leadership, three around inclusive district culture, standard four around culturally responsive instructional leadership and improvement, and standard six around effective organizational management. Of course, I leave it to my bosses to decide which are the most pressing for uh, of the eight, or maybe you want five, or maybe you want all eight, or maybe you want two, I don't know. Uh, but those for a starter set are, are the four that, you know, reflecting which ones do I think uh, create a well-rounded tool. Those seem like areas where we have work to do. Um, the, the following section are, is a rubric for each of those standards. So, you know, we can be objective, the board can be objective, and so how it rates. Uh, my performance across the, each of those leadership standards. So you see the substandards in a description, but the rubrics actually, you know, you should be able to sort of have evidence uh, or, or check off for yourself, well, what's in, did, did he demonstrate this leadership standard in an ineffective way, in, in a way that shows work that's developing? Did he effectively uh, perform or demonstrate this leadership standard, or is he accomplished in this area? So, so you see a description in, a, in the rubric for each of the standards what an individual board member would do is reflect on the evidence and say, well, he, I think maybe he's developing, so I'm going to check developing. That, that, gives, that garners a score of two. Uh, you'll see at the end, when you collect all seven board members, you would collect your scores to arrive at a summary rating. So you just see the same pattern for the other three standards, uh, a rubric, a description of what performance levels are, and a summary rating that an individual board member would check off. Um, okay. The second half of the proposed soup evaluation tool is, is the board goals, those academic milestones. So for third grade reading, uh, the board had decided that uh, we had a long conversation around how map growth uh, is, is a pretty well-aligned predictor uh, of where we think the trend will go with the SBAP uh, summative assessment, statewide assessment. Um, and so we had set an expectation that underserved students in particular, uh, that we were going to use them as the barometer uh, for growth, uh, which in this case the goal was 44% to 60% meeting the growth expectation that we have for them uh, in reading. Uh, included here, thank you uh, to our data team, um, I, I put the, the numbers that they've provided for me into a table to just try to highlight the group that we're talking about. So they're in the first row. Uh, so you see not just the end size or the number of students, uh, but also the percentage of those that have met the growth targets over the last uh, three years. Uh, and these are winter to winter growth uh, rates. You see the two year change to give you some perspective and you see the one-year change. So I've tried to highlight for you there in the peach color uh, where that would be. So if we're trying to go from 44 to 60, and you saw uh, uh, a one-year change of a drop of two and a half, then uh, you know, it, it would be reported as, uh, if you go to the next page 11, you, know, you would have to give it a summary rating of, if it's dropped two and a half, well, clearly that's below the performance target. You would check one. Um, and, and so on. Now, I've, the, the question the board has to contend with is, well, what are the appropriate performance level targets that would constitute a rating one, two, three, and four? Uh, I've just given you an example here 
uh, you may decide, well, I'm not giving him a significant progress unless it's five percentage points or more. Uh, that's pretty ambitious, but you could decide to do that. Um, and you could break it down. So that, that's something you'll have to ask yourself. Uh, and we ask ourselves, well, what's a reasonable rate of growth? Because we have to have these exact same conversations with our principals and with our teachers in conferences. Uh, and so this tool, you, you would outline as a board what those growth change targets should be so that the board as a whole could give a consistent rating. Now you just have some, some additional data there uh, on the mean test force. And Joey, you're back here, so correct me or throw something at me if I'm saying something wrong. Um, next Excuse board. Excuse me, can you say that again? That where are the mean? Oh, the mean scores. Okay, yeah. sorry. You have two tables, page. the growth, the expected growth, winner to winner, and then just the mean test point. So you see something similar with fifth grade math, uh, also using underserved students of color as the barometer student group. Um, and so you see uh, uh, met expected growth, uh, end size, and percentage. Uh, you see highlighted in the peach, I put it for you there in the first row, what the one year change was. Now remember, this is based on last winter's map, so I want you to think about where were our students <laughs> yeah, last January, winter. February. So, you know, see a percentage drop, uh, more or less, uh, you know, it could be much more catastrophic, uh, but, but that's where students uh, showed up. We also, you'll Wait. notice in the end size that 515 historically underserved students of color took the map. Uh, mid-year as opposed to 646. Yes, uh, Director Lowry is, is noticing some uh, an interesting anomaly here. So you see for yes. black uh, a plus 9.2 percent. I, I will note the end size dropped, so there were 80 less kids or so that took it, uh, mm -hmm. but we did see uh, 9.2 percent more black kids meeting the growth target. But then we've got 9.1 multiracial kids not meeting 9% more. Yeah, so yeah, we so. can dive into that a little bit more, but it's an interesting observation. Those are exactly the kinds of things that make us say, well, let's, what's, let's, going, what's on? going on there? Uh, what schools were they at? Was there something in particular? Was there a strategy? Was it the extended learning? Was it the mentor? Who knows? It's uh, also, I mean, the, the ends are small, so it's hard. There's so a small universe in which to Correct. do so it is important to watch the end size because then the percentage could fluctuate wildly uh, when the numbers are smaller. And one thing to remember is these aren't the same children. Sorry. Right? The kids we tested as fifth graders in 2020 were not the fifth graders we tested in 2021. So there are some slight differences between cohorts as far as like where they are on, on the scale. Especially with this small number. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, I mean, so we just need to take, um, like, it's a whole different cohort. It's a whole different fifth grader. Correct. This, the, what is that called? The sample size is small. Um, it's during COVID. I think there's a lot of reasons. I think they, right. Yeah. So imagine this year's cohort in the out. fall and winter, if they were out for 18 months versus these kids who were out half that. Right, right. See where they are, yeah. Um, so you see similarly a rubrics for a growth change uh, level or performance target the board would need to establish so that you could all objectively also rate it. So in this case, there's not a lot of subjectivity other than setting the performance target uh, because the numbers are the numbers, uh, which become the rating. So it just, it just depends on how aggressively or, or how, how the board wants to set those <laughs> targets. And then you see mean test scores again. So the next board goal is the eighth grade graduate portrait. So initially, so can I ask a question before we move on, yeah. Dr. Proctor, if you don't mind, a question of you and just um, talk a little bit about your experience in other places on sort of realistic growth expectations, and especially, you know, when you look at uh, when we began implementing a new set of strategies under the superintendent's leadership. I'm just interested in your take. Yeah, so um, in, in, a, in Philadelphia, of course, just being over school improvement processes before we can really um, identify a target in any given year, you want to look at trend data over time to kind of see what's happening within the trend and then identify locally what, what is impacting the trend. And then from there, given the current state, you'll then be able to determine taking some trend data, looking at trend averages, uh, assessing the current state, current condition. For example, the, the mere fact that we're talking about pandemic, 
uh, low end size, et cetera. And then you kind of do a formulation to determine what, what a growth uh, would be. Um, it's hard to kind of just put out a number without doing that deep dive first. Um, and that's the kind of work that's necessary to really, to come up with a, an adequate a, a growth target, yeah. Yeah, so in, in some spaces, you, it may be uh, three to five percentage, you know, three percentage points. It may be, you know, uh, five percentage points. It just, it determines, it's determined, determined on the trends and then dependent on the current state of what is happening in, in their, you know, practices we have in place to help us achieve the goal, right? So, um, you know, part of the after setting the goal is then looking at what strategies and action steps you're putting in place to, to make sure that we're there. So it's a, it's a, a deep analysis over time and looking at trends. A quick question to that. So when we're looking at trends with the pandemic happening, are you thinking we should start afresh with, so from the pandemic even before, or should we look at historical trends that we already have that data, you know, yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, we know that for sure the pandemic and the, the learning structures that were resulting um, from the pandemic really put students uh, at a loss. And when there is, um, in a, you know, if, for example, we identify that there was a gap and then we go into a pandemic state, um, it kind of creates a, a, a deeper gap, if you will. And that means that we have to really um, address and do some radical strategies to, to help support students uh, in their learning so that we could get back to baseline. I think, I think if you look at trend data now, it'll give you a baseline of say what happened. If you look at trend data before the pandemic, it'll give you a baseline of what was happening in the organization um, before the pandemic. But then you need to then look at um, the conditions, that's why I spoke about the current conditions of what we're experiencing now with pandemic, with um, instructional staff that is out and um, unable to fill um, certain, you know, roles and and getting the right teachers in front of the te in front of children every day um, and consistently every day. Um, those are the things that we'll have to play in. So not so much, you know, I wouldn't say start from base from fresh. I think again, it's the analysis that's going to point you in the right direction. So to your question, Director Holland, it'd be great if we had 10 years on map data, but when this administration started its tenure, there was no interim assessment for fifth grade math science. So what you see is the data we, we have today, which is why we ended up with the starting number, uh, but we have to look at each of the upcoming cycles to say, well, with this current cohort, are they approximating sort of the original baseline of 41%? Or do we need to refresh that? Maybe they're doing better. I don't know. Uh, other considerations are there hadn't been an elementary math curriculum option in yes. how long? Ten years? Absolutely. Well, there's that. And so Absolutely. just a small note there, we actually have new math textbooks and, and program uh, in our elementary school. So as in any district, there's going to be probably a, a slight implementation dip because teachers and students are using it for the first time, but we want to think that that investment of bond resources uh, is going to help provide a more consistent, uniform, standards-based uh, curriculum for which to work from, even if that makes a positive difference. So when we're looking at the math data, and it says 41%, that means that 41% of the students are on grade level? Or meeting growth targets. Or meeting growth targets. So it's growth about growth targets. targets. So it's not about proficiency, it's about growth, which because is the past tools we had were about proficiency. Well, the past tool was the state summit, which right. gives you a grade level proficiency rate. Right. And since we decided to use, we want quicker, rapid cycles of, 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 of information, so we instituted math. And that then now so we can adjust more readily. More quickly. Uh, are we on track? Are we seeing growth? We know that the growth is a predictor to the summit of performance. And I remember Dr. Brown saying that Correct. when we see kids on target for growth, we see a correlation in the. Right. Um, Which was pretty tight the last Yeah, time. but we still have the summative data as well. We still have the summative data. So we have that chart. Right. So I want to take just a pause there. I know, uh, Julia, you had questions about this uh, in an email earlier around the um, proficiency versus growth. So just because we're talking about it, I want to give you an opportunity to ask. 
We don't hear you. You're muted, Julia. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'd like to, um, I agree we should continue to focus on growth, um, but I do think we also need to keep our eye on proficiency and have the data um, there and linked so that we can see um, how that growth is linking ultimately to proficiency. Um, and so that we can also see um, how the trajectory um, over time, if whatever the goals we set, how that's going to get us eventually to um, all of our kids um, either meeting or exceeding sort of grade level expectations. Um, so it, it's not a substitute for the growth metric, but it's an important linkage so that, again, I think for most people in our community, um, ultimately sort of how they think about it, they are, whether it's your, your child or um, a class is whether um, students are at ben benchmarks so that we can see like if, if we set this level and the superintendent and the larger district um, team is uh, successful in meeting it, when are we going to see like the changes in levels of proficiency? Um, I just think it's an important conversation for us to have, again, not as a substitute as the growth for the metric, but as a a, a, a more um, full conversation with parents and students. So we've tried to, we have this conversation, being selective about choosing an indicator for each board goal. That doesn't preclude us, and of course we're going to be transparent about seeing all of the other data that comes to us during the course of the year. Because we're using math growth for third grade and fifth grade doesn't mean we're not going to look at SBAC data. You'll continue to see that annual data disaggregated by grade level by school. Our parents get a student summary of their child's SPAC uh, performance as well, which is uh, a proficiency-based uh, summative. So uh, you could say the same thing about perception data or a successful school survey or all of the other Dibbles data. We have lots of uh, indicators. We could use those. How cumbersome do you want to make the tool? Uh, and how do we keep using those to inform our school and district improvement? and individual student uh, differentiation. So you can choose to substitute them if that's what you want to do uh, for one of these other indicators, but uh, it's not going to preclude us from being transparent as a district. Uh, they are how our school and our district is held accountable uh, in that district report card. So that data is there for the world to see. Uh, it's what everybody's waiting for every fall, uh, and it's what our parents get in the mail. Yeah. And what I, what I, just, just, just to clarify, I wasn't suggesting substituting it. I was suggesting and linking it so that um, we can all have a comprehensive, integrated look at um, the type of growth that we're shooting for and supporting, um, and then how that links overall to um, performance data. So what, what I'm, what I'm going to say in response, because we had this conversation two years ago, and, and I think what I'm hearing from the superintendent is proficiency data is available, and we can provide that. My reluctance of, of putting it into a board goal is, is really specifically around what are, we, what are we motivating the district to do. And the conversation we had two years ago, we were pretty explicit about the fact that if we're measuring proficiency as a, as a, as a form of evaluation, it incentivizes the district to take kids that are close and get them over the line. Right. We, yeah, I, I, I think Andrew. I just to clarify because I don't. We don't need to um, have that same conversation over, over again. What I'm, what I'm trying to express is so. Say, um, the growth target is three per, three percent, or say it's ten percent. What what does that mean in terms of getting our kids? You know, at at what rate of change are we going to? be getting kids to proficiency. And again, it's not for cherry picking those who are closest to the target, but really, you know, how, how are we looking strategically of how that links to where, where we want kids to, to end up. Right. So I'm gonna And if it's like, hey, we're never gonna get we're never gonna get there, that's a good conversation. That's that's an important conversation to, to have. Director Brett members, can um can we take turns? Can you can you please go ahead, uh, Director Scott? And so so, so I, I think my, my issue is I, I don't actually want to link it as part of a board goal. If if what you're suggesting is that we provide that data to the board on occasion, you know, throughout the year, that's fine. If we provide it publicly, I think we already do. I don't want proficiency to be the measure of evaluation because of those concerns over 
um, over what it incentivizes. And it's why when we agreed on growth a couple of years ago, that's what I agreed on. So I agree with you. I don't want to keep having the conversation. It does feel like you bring it up every every year. So that's why I guess I'm just trying to clarify. Are you asking to put it in as a board goal or are you just asking to get that data provided? I'm asking to have the data at the same at the same time, not integrated into the board goal. I'm I'm supportive of growth being the measurement. I just want to see how it links into the overall achievement and where we are in our longer term trajectory. And I think I was going to say. And uh, just before yeah, I was we just going to ask, is it possible to do both? Well, we're not, we, we, directors we get won't both. get them at the same time because you're going to get data when it becomes available. So after the fall <clears> assessment, <throat> you'll get the fall body of data. After the winter mid years, you'll get them there. The summatives, you'll see them in September because we don't get the data to clean up until the end of August, usually. And then we would have, as this being proposed in an evaluation cycle, all of the year old data, all of the post-secondary <clears throat> data that is your board goal, you would get all of that at the start of the next school year. Then we could have a full conversation. What did we notice about fall and winter interims that got us the summatives that we observed? And so now you can have a much more thorough conversation about, well, let's look back at what, some, what we attribute that growth or decline to. Before we leave this conversation, a little tangent, just because we have new leadership in the room, Dr. Bird and Dr. Proctor, I'm really interested in how we communicate to parents and guardians about where their children are um, relative to growth and proficiency. And right now, I think there's agreement that our structure of our report cards are really imperfect um, to be charitable. So um, I'm, I'm asking you guys to just keep us updated on, on your ideas and progress on that front. So, so we have revised that all the true report cards last week, uh, last week a revision of that, and we're going to meet again with KT to do another uh, uh, review of that uh, to see how it worked last year and make some more additional revisions. It's much easier to read for parents and um, hopefully it gets to the point much quicker. If it was a very long back <laughs> <clears throat> but does it does it also give them a better understanding of their child's actual standing relative to um, benchmark expectations? Well, so that uh, that's the part that we're going to be going back to revisit to refine. Because keep I, us I posted. We had public comment of a parent saying my kid got all A's or whatever the thing is, but they didn't meet on the F back. So right. where is the like? Why are they getting A's when they're not exactly. proficient? proficient. Yeah. So that's a great question. And yeah. That would be question is when you're using this math assessment, is that a correlation to if they're growing in the math assessment, is that a direct correlation to them meaning proficiency? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, yeah, we see that in the test. That's what right. So we we spent a couple of board work sessions in the past talking about the correlation between math assessment data. We have Joe Sons here from our Office of Research Assessment and Accountability. So if you don't know Joe, uh, Joe hey, is our data guy. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to speak a little bit to how the map provide, is a predictor of the summative? Um, yeah, so NWEA has certainly done correlation studies from map scores to various tests like Smarter Balance, like the, PF, or the uh, SAT and the ACT tests. And one of the data points they provide is whether students are predicted to be proficient on those tests or not. And I, I don't remember if we have one of those indicators in here, but that's certainly something we can provide uh, in terms of, and and we can actually provide to parents if we want to include that on our test score mailing in the summers, for example, we can say your student, you know, this year should be on track to be proficient on smart balance or not. That doesn't correlate back to our grading practices, however, which is a different <laughs> separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I want to keep, and we don't have very much time left. Um, Superintendent, I know there was a question about the eighth grade um, measure we could talk about, and then, and then the high school one, and then let's, let's do some uh, quick round. Okay. Thank well. you. And Jackson has a question I want to make sure. Okay. Um, uh, on eighth grade, uh, we spent time with our community developing a, a graduate portrait. Uh, we had great conversation around, you know, we don't want to wait till the 12th grade to see if they have those skills, dispositions that we talked about. We said, and, and concurrently, there was a lot of conversation around alternative assessment, around a more holistic view of student growth uh, uh, as, as people and their people. Uh, we talked about a capstone, for instance, that would be you know, something that would be a signature practice of EPS, that in the eighth grade, that students would know entering the middle years that before you leave here, you're going to have to present publicly a portfolio 
speaks to sort of that wheel of the graduate portrait and where you assess yourself along areas of, you know, whether it's content knowledge or empathy or compassion or any of the other dispositions. And we thought it would be important for a student to be able to sort of reflect on their own sense of growing agency and personal growth about where they are uh, on the graduate portrait. So we knew that that was a precursor to a lot of middle school innovation and redesign work that would need to happen. Uh, and we, we've really started to jump in now with the new director, uh, with a team that has continued meeting uh, and doing some, uh, beginning some empathy interviews to, to really start to bring some definition to what, what do we mean by the kinds of middle schools, uh, middle years experience that we want students to have in PPS. Uh, as those conversations develop, what will emerge are some indicators uh, and, and, and how to format uh, what, what data we could collect. It might be more qualitative, but there might be some other measures in there. The board at, at the time said, well, let's use SVAC data as a placeholder for ELA and math. Uh, and you notice here it's for, it's for all students, uh, and you see the, the data here. But if uh, either Cheryl or Sean want to speak to our middle school redesign work, just to give you a little sense of where we are right now, the status of it. Yeah, so we're definitely, um we are we have um, a set of pilot uh, schools that are working this year um, with our director of middle school and design uh, to really uh, hone in on problem or practice and to go through a continuous improvement um, um, and design process uh, to to really see what shifts and changes need to occur within the middle school programming for students uh, we are also looking at that because the board goal speaks about um, middle year and division is to ensure that students have um, this capstone type of experience at the end of eighth grade. We are ensuring that um, through a, a middle year's focus that we're ensuring that the sixth through eighth, eighth grade year experience is such that it would help um, students to really start reflecting and doing that self-assessment um, grounded in some project-based learning um, practices and inquiry learning, um, starting with student interests and developing um, students from that interest point and in, in giving them entry into not just their content curriculum, but also um, understanding those, deposition, uh, those dispositions, excuse me, that uh, we want to see them be able to deliver on and, and present by the end of eighth grade. So we are focusing our um, looking at our, how we redesign our even our work in the academic office to um, really narrow and make our scope student centered in our um, systems design as well. So I think you're hearing the work has commenced. It's developing. Yep. We don't have a set of indicators for eighth grade yet that are yep. you know six, you know that are on the continuum towards the graduate portrait. Yep. So. Uh, what we continue to have is the SBAC as a placeholder for which we don't have data in the last two years. Knowing that, we provided the board with interim data, so we just gave you map data, so you have a sense of how our data creators are doing, and I think you see the overall in the charts there on page 16, that you know we saw a similar pattern to what NWA saw across the country, you know, slight drop off uh, in reading, but interestingly, a nudge upwards in math. I don't understand it, but that's what it is. And it seems to be consistent with what most districts uh, were observing. Dr. Proctor, does that work in the pilot schools on the middle grades uh, work uh, include student input? Yeah, in design. So there was a whole process of um, like an empathy study uh, that was done and that included students. Um, we do have a student advisory uh, group uh, that includes um, what we found funny enough is that when you ask students going into middle school, what do you expect out of middle school? They almost uh, don't know. So we also included some uh, ninth grade student body to help inform uh, based on their experiences as well. But definitely it includes student voice uh, through a full empathy study and, and design process. And, and if I may, I mean, just want to be able to click on that. I mean, you know, just similar to the, to the vision. <laughs> What? Double click. Double click. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling him on that. Uh, the vision, you know, we started the, the visioning process with the, the student summit. It's similar. This empathy tour was really uh, geared towards really understanding the middle school experience uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, putting ourselves as adults in the shoes of students. And I think that's been the challenge with middle school redesign across the country 
prior to this kind of new way of thinking. I think the middle school experience has always been shaped by what parents want or what current parents perceive middle school needs to be. But versus what we're doing is saying, what do students want middle yeah. school grades to be? Because that is where they're finding their spark. That is where they're finding, you know, what makes them, you know, thrive in school. And so that empathy uh, tour was real, has been, and will be, it continues to be instrumental. Just and then just out. lastly on this middle school redesign work, the district is getting technical assistance from a group that has been working with uh, larger districts around the country with this. Some board members joined staff uh, on a trip to Miami-Dade County, for example. They're pretty involved and a few years down the road on middle school redesign. One of the suggestions they strongly made is start with your students and empathy tours. Uh, use that as a starting point. Okay. That's exactly what's going to happen. So we're at 6 o'clock. Um, Thank you. I think ideally, um, Chair DePass, if it's okay, um, if we did a, a quick round, a lightning round with, with members, board members, about sort of the decisions needed, and I think that maybe that'll inform whether we we have consensus or whether there's still something we got to any questions and need more time Absolutely. on this. Is that, yes, is that okay? That's great. Thank you. Great. And maybe we'll start. So, yeah, um, I just had a, a question about the, um, the, the, rubric, the rubric for the uh, board goals. And the rubric starts, it goes one through four. And my question is, would we, why would we start at one if there's a less than zero percent change? question about numbering the, the rubric. Um, I'm, I'm generally in favor of moving the date of the evaluation. Um, I'm in favor of this hybrid model um, as we're, uh, to use as a template, using the four, I, I like the four leadership standards. Um, so I'm comfortable adopt, adopting the template um, with those fewer leadership standards and, and including board goals. Um, I'd really like to see, um, Dr. Proctor, what you spoke to about um, how, being able to do an analysis breaking down the data. I'd like to hear more about that and wonder if we have the staff capacity and and wherewithal to, to do that work, to, to sort of tease apart. Um, because right now we don't we, we don't have a good baseline. I mean, we have a baseline that's pandemic um, influenced. And I'd like to see us get to real baseline data and a real trend line that we could look back on and say, this is going to the growth uh, trajectory, and this is what we expect it to be projected out. Um, that's it. Those are my comments. Thank you. Um, so I love this progress monitoring calendar, the last page. Whoever took the time to put that, that together, that's really helpful. And I hope that we are very liberal in how many of those activities we include on our board agendas. So that we're making that really visible for us and we're um, kind of uh, calibrating it to our board goals. Um, are we are we looking to formally adopt this template? Will we have to approve will we approve this template? We we will not in work session. But, but will we eventually? <laughs> yeah. So when so um, if, if there's consensus, I think we would do it at the next meeting. Okay, and so when we do that, we won't have um, our calendar settled, our prospective calendar settled, taking in all this information about when data is available? Well, or will we? I know when we talked about this before, we were looking at this year, kind of in the year we gathered that data. And then based on the evaluations that we agreed with, then we use that for the next calendar year. Since, since we were trying to get all this data. So okay, yeah. so like right now, probably this cycle that we're in is more like, it's yeah, more than a year. It's looking at this school year and it, and the data being collected for this school year. Right. So earlier there was the proposal of, well, it could be October. So we would take on the timeline and move the activity of moving the self-evaluation and the end of year performance evaluation down to October. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that would make for a complete cycle of the school year. So we would make that adjustment on the timeline here. Okay, I'm down with that. Uh, yeah, my only my only thing is to uh, make sure that we sort of regularly, as a board, are checking in on our progress monitoring when we have any new news to to think on. Yeah, and again, um, Director Scott and Director Hollins have been tasked with meeting with the with the superintendent and bringing that information back in a regular cadence, whether that's quarterly or as needed. That's, that's their job. They're doing a great job so far. <laughs> great job. Uh, <laughs> Director Brim Edwards? 
So I'm just going to, as I thought, I think I heard the question. So I do support changing the timeline that was suggested. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, I, um, I'm okay having a hybrid as long as the um, growth metrics are continue to be double weighted. Because um, one of the things about the OSBA standards is they uh, don't really have smart metrics. So it's more of a just uh, qualitative um, measurement, which, which is important, but it's, um, I also think there's some things that from a quantitative standpoint that would be important to build in. Um, of the four standards, um, I would suggest um, that we include um, community communications and community relations in place of um, maybe the organizational uh, piece. I just think that's that's a standard that we've had a lot of discussion about in the past, um, and I think would be worth, um, especially in a year that we're sort of resetting, um, continue to have uh, leadership focus on. Uh, and let's see, sorry, I talked about two times waiting. Um, and I do think there is um, uh, a subsequent conversation, which we don't have time for tonight about, um, you know, what, what is the growth target how, and how it gets, how it gets set. Um, and, and then how, how, we, how we score against that. Um, but again, that's a much longer conversation. So I think I answered your questions that you raised or you posed, Andrew. Thank you. Dr. Green? Um, I don't think I have, my wife is, she's watching, she's counting, and I just said, um, I'm trying to watch. Thanks for that again. So, I don't believe I have any, any issues with moving the, the date. Um, as far as like December, I don't think I really care. I think it's better if we get all the data available to us so we can make a long rounded decision. What I didn't hear in this, and, and maybe I missed it, so charge it to my head, not my heart, somebody could share it with me where I missed it at, is specifically, I think somewhere in here on what, we, what we're what we evaluating should be specifically where are the, like, how we're, the black kids are getting closer to the white kids, like in that gap. I want to specifically say that part of the thing, one of the things that we're going to be holding you accountable for is directly making that gap and and so i'm thinking we look at it from what is the number before you got here what was the trend looking like before you came what that was because i understand we need to look at trends so let's look at the data before you came let's look at the data for the the years that you were here while we you know before this and now let's look at where we're at and say how did the gap between black kids and white kids and I'm black males, because they're the ones at the bottom. You know? So how did that gap either get lesser or get close? And then I feel like you should be greater than that. And so that's, but I didn't see that. It's not that it's not here. And maybe it is, and someone can just tell me, this is exactly where that says this at. This is exactly how we hold, you know, hold them accountable to that. But at some point, in order for me to feel comfortable, we have to have a direct correlation between the, the gap between black kids and white kids and it shrinking because that's all I, all this other stuff about you know whether we got good staff and people that have here I don't care I don't care if nobody likes you if that gap goes, goes down then I'm gonna be a fan I don't care if they say he's not worth all that if you get that gap down there's nobody who's going to champion more than me pay that man a million dollars a year because that blessing he moved the gap so if you can make that equal, I think you deserve $2 million a year. I don't care what you get. So but an argument for throw out how I lead. Uh, <laughs> and, and instead of using historically underserved as the barometer for 35th, maybe it should just be black. Right? And you I'm have to you know, have well, so I mean, that's what I'm hearing, you know. I mean, and I'm a, I'm a person. But I'm a very, I'm just, that's my truth. I have a, I have a black agenda, and I'm not afraid to say it. And so I need to know that everything that we are doing is intentionally trying to move the gap, decrease the gap between black kids and white kids. Because here's, here's another reality. It's a cold piece of work. 
If you raise the bottom, everything comes up. Yeah. That's our theory. That's, that's, that's our theory. That's, 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 that's what our particles are based on. Your point is you're getting at, I mean, we could see growth in our underserved students of 5%. But growth in our white students was six or seven. That's a very different, right. like that's a right. very different lens to sort of look at versus you know if, if you know if, if we were seeing that what we want to see is the rapid growth in our underserved students, particularly our black students, right? And that's what I'm, that's what I mean. I think that's a really interesting conversation to have, and I, I know I know we're having a retreat later this year to, to sort of dive back into these. And, and I, I want to be clear: I don't think we should. Be revising our goals because again, when we when we have our goals, this is what the superintendent and his team based their strategic plan and everything else on. But I, I see this as not so much as a revision as as a potential addition to it, right? Sort of saying like like it's we already have the goal of, of, of raising the student achievement. What you want to also know is, did we raise the student achievement more or less than than what we could have done? So I, you know, I want to just say that's um, what my final comment. That I the only thing I noticed about the template is it still. Because it's based on Oregon School Boards, um, Oregon School Boards Association, who um, created a member of color caucus just three years ago. So the notion of equity is new to them, like many other institutions in Oregon. Um, and and it, in this document, it's it says historically underserved throughout. And while it, the the data is disaggregated by race, I don't think the focus is on. The term historically underserved is a way of um, not saying black. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, it made me think of those thermometers, those fundraising thermometers that you can see where the level is. And I think I think it's a good idea that uh, maybe we could task um, Director Hollins and Scott to come up with a way that, um, mm -hmm. that measures that the gap, because that's why we're all here is to close. I mean, everyone in the room, I would guess, Pretty much is here to close the gap, including our superintendent. So, and, and the team. How, it's just, how do we? How do we? You know, how does that? How do we represent that? And how do we measure against it? So I, I would say that, you know, initially when we first developed these four goals, we really talked explicitly about Black and Native students. And I, you know, in my memory, which is not always accurate, I remembered that we had said explicitly in our board goals, not just underserved students, but Black and Native, because those are the the two groups we really intentionally targeted. So, so I'd be in support of, of seeing us say, we want to close these gaps, the opportunity gaps for Black and Native students, and really say that. Um, mm -hmm. but we want to close the gap for all students. We want all students to succeed, but I think we, we want to have a really targeted focus on our Black students and our Native students. And just remind which, that is our strategic that right. so That's what all our strategies are. But I'd like to see it in the, in the evaluation, maybe explicitly spelled out or in the board goals. Um, I do think, so I'm going to answer the three questions, which I already did, but um, yes, I, the OSBA leadership standards. Um, I think for me, Michelle, last year you had added several pieces into these leadership standards, and Superintendent, I heard you say those are still here, especially around, we've, we've mentioned many times, um, diversity of staff and increasing, especially our black uh, teachers and leaders and retaining our black teachers and leaders. So again, as we can be more explicit, um, maybe even just have that in there. Uh, would be one thing that that to adapt these a little further maybe if if there's pieces that people are really passionate about that aren't called out specifically i think we need to call them out specifically and then um, i do like these four um, i'd be okay with changing out communications i i feel like given the history of this district i like effective organizational management as a standard um, but i could see communications substituting for for one of the other ones perhaps we could have that further conversation or maybe we can add yeah. Well, well, I, I don't want to add. I think four is enough. Too much. Um, also, organizational management takes the collapse. That's probably the wrong word to use. Well, we could even fiscal management, right. which goes away. So that's yeah, but fiscal management is kind of important. It's under that same umbrella. <laughs> so we're at um, I'm not team. Can I finish? <laughs> uh, so the board, uh, I do feel comfortable adopting the template and adjusting the data as um, it comes in, and know that that will be a continued conversation with Director Scott and Holland. And then I do think moving it to the fall would be the, the most sensible thing. So we're not always scrambling to try to get data and um, that we can have the full sort of view of a school year when we're, we're evaluating the superintendent and the staff, you know, the team on what all has taken place this year. My thoughts are already incorporated. Uh, no problems. <laughs> um, quick. Um, one thing I would change a little bit, I need to start looking into is the system that we use um, on some of the leadership performance. Um, 
I think a lot of these could just be yes and no. Um, and that's on my only, my only uh, contribution to this. Anything else I'm going to Thank you. Thanks for the conversation. We'll be looking back. Can I just say for our progress monitoring, um, in our disaggregated data here, we don't have our English language learners or our special education students called out, and that's something that I would really like to see. That's a great addition. And um, I think Representative Weinberg had a comment. Oh. Here. Yeah, so for all those, I think yes, for OSPA leadership standards, having both those is important. Um, for adopting the agenda, um, for target setting in a few months, that totally makes sense. And for number three, the timeline, my only concern is if we're moving the timeline back to September, most work plans for the district start August or July. How flexible is that going to be? Maybe if we're not waiting even later than that. Mm -hmm. So is there any course correction that is available to happen after we get that evaluation? That's a really good the, point. The whole, we'll have to change our whole mindset around this being an iterative process because we actually prepare our department level work plans and a budget right after the winter break mm -hmm. so that we're ready for the early spring. So. You know, there has to be enough adaptability built in for us to adjust. And then just the last word, we didn't talk about it, the last board goal, this is fresh data, so I just want to make sure to call it out. Um, we said post-secondary included any one of these categories or pathways that a student could choose. Uh, thankfully, you'll see there's actually a lot of positives yeah. Uh, yeah. across those, which shows that our high school success plan is really getting a grip. Uh, and helping support students at all in all student groups mostly uh, through one of those pathways. So good growth there. And one last comment about the empathy interviews for the middle school redesign. I think even incorporating seniors' views as well, just like retrospectively, what helped them or what would have helped them be ready for high school and then afterwards, I think it's super helpful. Yeah. Also, ninth and tenth graders so you get the full middle school experience. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a 10 minute break before we start. Five? I, I need, I have a special reason.